Chapter 6 of The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysterious Stranger, Chapter 6. In a moment we were in a French village. We walked through a great factory of some sort, where men and women and little children were toiling in heat and dirt and a fog of dust, and they were clothed in rags and drooped at their work, for they were worn and half-starved and weak and drowsy. Satan said, It is some more moral sense. The proprietors are rich and very holy, but the wage they pay to these poor brothers and sisters of theirs is only enough to keep them from dropping dead with hunger. The work hours are fourteen per day, winter and summer, from six in the morning till eight at night, little children and all. And they walk to and from the pigsties which they inhabit four miles each way through mud and slush rain snow sleet and storm daily year in and year out they get four hours of sleep they kennel together three families in a room in unimaginable filth and stench and disease comes and they die off like flies have they committed a crime these mangy things no what have they done that they are punished so nothing at all except getting themselves born into your foolish race you have seen how they treat a miss doer there in the jail now you see how they treat the innocent and the worthy is your race logical are these ill-smelling innocents better off than that heretic indeed no his punishment is trivial compared with theirs they broke him on the wheel and smashed him to rags and pulp after we left, and he is dead now, and free of your precious race. But these poor slaves here, why, they have been dying for years, and some of them will not escape from life for years to come. It is the moral sense which teaches the factory proprietors the difference between right and wrong. You perceive the result." they think themselves better than dogs <laughs> you are such an illogical unreasoning race and paltry oh unspeakably then he dropped all seriousness and just overstrained himself making fun of us and deriding our pride in our warlike deeds our great heroes our imperishable fames our mighty kings our ancient aristocracies our venerable history and laughed and laughed till it was enough to make a person sick to hear him and finally he sobered a little and said but after all it is not all ridiculous. There is a sort of pathos about it when one remembers how few are your days, how childish your pomps, and what shadows you are. Presently all things vanished suddenly from my sight, and I knew what it meant. The next moment we were walking along in our village, and down toward the river I saw the twinkling lights of the golden stag, then in the dark I heard a joyful cry. He's come again! It was Seppi Wolmeyer. He had felt his blood leap and his spirits rise in a way that could mean only one thing, and he knew Satan was near, although it was too dark to see him. He came to us, and we walked along together, and Seppi poured out his gladness like water. It was as if he were a lover and had found his sweetheart who had been lost. Seppi was a smart and animated boy, and had enthusiasm and expression, and was a contrast to Nicholas and me. He was full of the last new mystery now, the disappearance of Hans Upper to the village loafer. People were beginning to be curious about it, he said. He did not say anxious. Curious was the right word, and strong enough. No one had seen Hans for a couple of days. Not since he did that brutal thing, you know, he said. What brutal thing? It was Satan that asked. 
well he is always clubbing his dog which is a good dog and his only friend and is faithful and loves him and does no one any harm and two days ago he was at it again just for nothing just for pleasure and the dog was howling and begging and theodore and i begged too but he threatened us and struck the dog again with all his might and knocked one of his eyes out and he said to us there i hope you are satisfied now that's what you have got for him by your damned meddling and he laughed the heartless brute seppi's voice trembled with pity and anger i guessed what satan would say and he said it there is that misused word again that shabby slander brutes do not act like that but only men well it was inhuman anyway no it wasn't seppi it was human quite distinctly human it is not pleasant to hear you libel the higher animals by attributing to them dispositions which they are free from and which are found nowhere but in the human heart none of the higher animals is tainted with the disease called the moral sense purify your language seppi drop those lying phrases out of it he spoke pretty sternly for him and i was sorry i hadn't warned seppi to be more particular about the word he used i knew how he was feeling he would not want to offend satan he would rather offend all his kin there was an uncomfortable silence but relief soon came for that poor dog came along now with his eye hanging down and went straight to satan and began to moan and mutter brokenly and satan began to answer in the same way and it was plain that they were talking together in the dog language we all sat down in the grass in the moonlight for the clouds were breaking away now and satan took the dog's head in his lap and put the eye back in its place and the dog was comfortable and he wagged his tail and licked satan's hand and looked thankful and said the same i knew he was saying it though i did not understand the words then the two talked together a bit and satan said he says his master was drunk yes he was said we and an hour later he fell over the precipice there beyond the cliff pasture we know the place it is three miles from here and the dog has been often to the village begging people to go there but he was only driven away and not listened to we remembered it but hadn't understood what he wanted he only wanted help for the man who had misused him and he thought only of that and has had no food nor sought any he has watched by his master two nights what do you think of your race is heaven reserved for it and this dog ruled out as your teachers tell you can your race add anything to this dog's stock of morals and magnanimities he spoke to the creature who jumped up eager and happy and apparently ready for orders and impatient to execute them get some men go with the dog he will show you that carrion and take a priest along to arrange about insurance for death is near with the last word he vanished to our sorrow and disappointment we got the men and father adolf and we saw the man die nobody cared but the dog he mourned and grieved and licked the dead face and could not be comforted we buried him where he was and without a coffin for he had no money and no friend but the dog if we had been an hour earlier the priest would have been in time to send that poor creature to heaven but now he was gone down into the awful fires to burn for ever it seemed such a pity that in a world where so many people have difficulty to put in their time one little hour could not have been spared for this poor creature who needed it so much and to whom it would have made the difference between eternal joy and eternal pain it gave an appalling idea of the value of an hour and i thought i could never waste one again without remorse and terror seppi was depressed and grieved and said it must be so much better to be a dog and not run such awful risks we took this one home with us and kept him for our own 
Seppi had a very good thought as we were walking along, and it cheered us up and made us feel much better. He said the dog had forgiven the man that had wronged him so, and maybe God would accept that absolution. There was a very dull week now, for Satan did not come. Nothing much was going on, and we boys could not venture to go and see Margaret, because the nights were moonlit and our parents might find us out if we tried. But we came across Ursula a couple of times, taking a walk in the meadows beyond the river to air the cat, and we learned from her that things were going well. She had natty new clothes on and bore a prosperous look. The four groschen a day were arriving without a break, but were not being spent for food and wine and such things. The cat attended to all that. Margaret was enduring her forsakenness and isolation fairly well, all things considered, and was cheerful by help of Wilhelm Meidling. She spent an hour or two every night in the jail with her uncle, and had fattened him up with the cat's contributions. But she was curious to know more about Philip Traum, and hoped I would bring him again. Ursula was curious about him herself, and asked a good many questions about his uncle. It made the boys laugh, for I had told them the nonsense Satan had been stuffing her with. She got no satisfaction out of us, our tongues being tied. Ursula gave us a small item of information. Money being plenty now, she had taken on a servant to help about the house and run errands. She tried to tell it in a commonplace, matter-of-course way, but she was so set up by it and so vain of it that her pride in it leaked out pretty plainly. It was beautiful to see her veiled delight in this grandeur, poor old thing, but when we heard the name of the servant we wondered if she had been altogether wise. For although we were young and often thoughtless, we had fairly good perception on some matters. This boy was Gottfried Narr, a dull, good creature, with no harm in him and nothing against him personally. Still, he was under a cloud, and properly so, for it had not been six months since a social blight had mildewed the family. His grandmother had been burned as a witch." When that kind of malady is in the blood, it does not always come out with just one burning. Just now was not a good time for Ursula and Margaret to be having dealings with a member of such a family, for the witch terror had risen higher during the past year than it had ever reached in the memory of the oldest villagers. The mere mention of a witch was almost enough to frighten us out of our wits. This was natural enough, because of late years there were more kinds of witches than there used to be. In old times it had been only old women, but of late they were of all ages, even children of eight and nine. It was getting so that anybody might turn out to be a familiar of the devil. Age and sex hadn't anything to do with it. In our little region we had tried to extirpate the witches but the more of them we burned, the more of the breed rose up in their places. Once, in a school for girls only ten miles away, the teachers found that the back of one of the girls was all red and inflamed, and they were greatly frightened, believing it to be the devil's marks. The girl was scared and begged them not to denounce her, and said it was only fleas, but of course it would not do to let the matter rest there. All the girls were examined, and eleven out of the fifty were badly marked, the rest less so. A commission was appointed, but the eleven only cried for their mothers and would not confess. Then they were shut up, each by herself, in the dark, and put on black bread and water for ten days and nights, and by that time they were haggard and wild, and their eyes were dry, and they did not cry any more, but only sat and mumbled and would not take the food. Then one of them confessed, and said they had often ridden through the air on broomsticks to the witch's Sabbath, and in a bleak place high up in the mountains had danced and drunk and caroused with several hundred other witches and the evil one, and all had conducted themselves in a scandalous way, and had reviled the priests and blasphemed God. That is what she said. 
not in narrative form, for she was not able to remember any of the details without having them called to her mind one after the other, but the commission did that, for they knew just what questions to ask, they being all written down for the use of which commissioners two centuries before. They asked, Did you do so and so? And she always said, Yes, and looked weary and tired and took no interest in it. And so when the other ten heard that this one confessed, they confessed too, and answered yes to the questions. Then they were burned at the stake altogether, which was just and right, and everybody went from all the countryside to see it. I went too, and when I saw that one of them was a bonny, sweet girl I used to play with, and looked so pitiful there, chained to the stake, and her mother crying over her, and devouring her with kisses, and clinging around her neck, and saying, Oh, my God, oh, my God! It was too dreadful, and I went away. It was bitter cold weather when Gottfried's grandmother was burned. It was charged that she had cured bad headaches by kneading the person's head and neck with her fingers, as she said, but really by the devil's help, as everybody knew. They were going to examine her, but she stopped them and confessed straight off that her power was from the devil. So they appointed to burn her next morning, early, in our market square. The officer who was to prepare the fire was there first, and prepared it. She was there next, brought by the constables, who left her and went to fetch another witch. Her family did not come with her. They might be reviled, maybe stoned, if the people were excited. I came and gave her an apple. She was squatting at the fire, warming herself and waiting, and her old lips and hands were blue with the cold. A stranger came next. He was a traveller passing through, and he spoke to her gently, and seeing nobody but me there to hear, said he was sorry for her, and he asked if what she confessed was true, and she said no. He looked surprised, and still more sorry then, and asked her, Then why did you confess? I am old and very poor, she said, and I work for my living. There was no way but to confess. If I hadn't, they might have set me free. That would ruin me, for no one would forget that I had been suspected of being a witch, and so I would get no more work, and wherever I went they would set the dogs on me. In a little while I would starve. The fire is best. It is soon over. You have been good to me, you two, and I thank you. She snuggled closer to the fire and put out her hands to warm them, the snowflakes descending soft and still on her old gray head and making it white and whiter. The crowd was gathering now, and an egg came flying and struck her in the eye and broke and ran down her face. There was a laugh at that. I told Satan all about the eleven girls and the old woman once, but it did not affect him. He only said it was the human race, and what the human race did was of no consequence. And he said he had seen it made, and it was not made of clay. It was made of mud. Part of it was, anyway. I knew what he meant by that. The moral sense. He saw the thought in my head, and it tickled him and made him laugh. Then he called a bullock out of a pasture, and petted it, and talked with it, and said, There, he wouldn't drive children mad with hunger and fright and loneliness, and then burn them for confessing to things invented for them which had never happened, and neither would he break the hearts of innocent poor old women, and make them afraid to trust themselves among their own race, and he would not insult them in their death agony for he is not besmirched with the moral sense, but is as the angels are, and knows no wrong, and never does it. Lovely as he was, Satan could be cruelly offensive when he chose, and he always chose when the human race was brought to his attention. He always turned up his nose at it, and never had a kind word for it. Well, as I was saying, we boys doubted if it was a good time for Ursula to be hiring a member of the Narr family. We were right. When the people found it out, they were naturally indignant. And moreover, since Margaret and Ursula hadn't enough to eat themselves, 
where was the money coming from to feed another mouth? That is what they wanted to know, and in order to find out, they stopped avoiding Gottfried and began to seek his society and have sociable conversations with him. He was pleased, not thinking any harm and not seeing the trap, and so he talked innocently along and was no discreeter than a cow. Money, he said, they've got plenty of it. They pay me two groschen a week besides my keep, and they live on the fat of the land, I can tell you. The prince himself can't beat their table. This astonishing statement was conveyed by the astrologer to Father Adolf on a Sunday morning when he was returning from Mass. He was deeply moved and said, This must be looked into. He said there must be witchcraft at the bottom of it, and told the villagers to resume relations with Margaret and Ursula in a private and unostentious way, and keep both eyes open. They were told to keep their own counsel and not rouse the suspicions of the household. The villagers were at first a bit reluctant to enter such a dreadful place, but the priest said they would be under his protection while there, and no harm could come to them, particularly if they carried a trifle of holy water along, and kept their beads and crosses handy. This satisfied them, and made them willing to go. Envy and malice made the baser sort even eager to go and so poor margaret began to have company again and was as pleased as a cat she was like most anybody else just human and happy in her prosperities and not averse from showing them off a little and she was humanly grateful to have the warm shoulder turned to her and be smiled upon by her friends and the village again for of all the hard things to bear to be cut by your neighbors and left in contemptuous solitude is maybe the hardest. The bars were down, and we could all go there now. And we did, our parents and all, day after day. The cat began to strain herself. She provided the top of everything for those companies, and in abundance, among them many a dish and many a wine, which they had not tasted before, and which they had not even heard of except at second hand from the prince's servants, and the tableware was much above ordinary, too. Margaret was troubled at times, and pursued Ursula with questions to an uncomfortable degree. But Ursula stood her ground and stuck to it that it was providence, and said no word about the cat. Margaret knew that nothing was impossible to providence, but she could not help having doubts that this effort was from there, though she was afraid to say so, lest disaster come of it. Witchcraft occurred to her, but she put the thought aside, for this was before Godfrey joined the household, and she knew Ursula was pious and a bitter hater of witches. By the time Godfrey arrived, Providence was established, unshakably entrenched, and getting all the gratitude. The cat made no murmur, but went on composedly improving in style and prodigality by experience. In any community, big or little, there is always a fair proportion of people who are not malicious or unkind by nature, and who never do unkind things, except when they are overmastered by fear, or when their self-interest is greatly in danger, or some such matter as that. Esseldorf had its proportion of such people, and ordinarily their good and gentle influence was felt, but these were not ordinary times, on account of the witch dread, and so we did not seem to have any gentle and compassionate hearts left to speak of. Every person was frightened at the unaccountable state of things at Margaret's house, not doubting that witchcraft was at the bottom of it, and fright frenzied their reason. Naturally, there were some who pitied Margaret and Ursula for the danger that was gathering about them, but naturally they did not say so. It would not have been safe. So the others had it all their own way, and there was none to advise the ignorant girl and the foolish woman and warn them to modify their doings. We boys wanted to warn them, but we backed down when it came to the pinch, being afraid." we found that we were not manly enough nor brave enough to do a generous action when there was a chance that it could get us into trouble. Neither of us confessed this poor spirit to the others, but did as other people would have done, dropped the subject and talked about something else. 
and I knew we all felt mean, eating and drinking Margaret's fine things along with those companies of spies, and petting her and complimenting her with the rest, and seeing with self-reproach how foolishly happy she was, and never saying a word to put her on guard. And indeed she was happy, and as proud as a princess, and so grateful to have friends again. And all the time these people were watching with all their eyes, and reporting all they saw to Father Adolf. But he couldn't make head or tail of the situation. There must be an enchanter somewhere on the premises, but who was it? Margaret was not seen to do any jugglery, nor was Ursula, nor yet Godfried and still the wines and dainties never ran short, and a guest could not call for a thing and not get it. To produce these effects was unusual enough with witches and enchanters. That part of it was not new. But to do it without any incantations, or even any rumblings, or earthquakes, or lightnings, or apparitions, that was new, novel, wholly irregular. There was nothing in the books like this. Enchanted things were always unreal. Gold turned to dirt in an unenchanted atmosphere. Food withered away and vanished. But this test failed in the present case. The spies brought samples. Father Adolf prayed over them, exorcised them, but it did no good. They remained sound and real. They yielded to natural decay only, and took the usual time to do it. Father Adolf was not merely puzzled, he was also exasperated, for these evidences very nearly convinced him privately that there was no witchcraft in the matter. It did not wholly convince him, for this could be a new kind of witchcraft. There was a way to find out as to this. If this prodigal abundance of provender was not brought in from the outside, but produced on the premises— there was witchcraft, sure. End chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain Read for you by Ted DeLorme in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during March 2008.